Hi! It's been a little while since I've made a video just about Spore, but this one I think should be a doozy. I've been playing it again pretty recently, and I've been scrolling through the subreddit, combing through all the discords, and I've seen people asking questions about how certain looks came to be, looking for help figuring out different techniques and how to make their creations better. And I'm not gonna sit here and claim to be the god of Spore or have an encyclopedic knowledge, but I've been playing this game for 12 years over like five accounts, thousands on thousands of hours of playtime invested into it and I can make some pretty good looking stuff. So today, what I'm gonna do is give you every creator tip that I know of. And it's not so much instruction like this is how the editors work, I want to take you through like the actual process of making something cooler, and hopefully it'll help. So with that, let's get started with creatures. First things first, you don't need to do any of this. Spore is about making your own things and creating whatever makes you happy. But if you want to make your things look a little cooler, then I'm going to give you my advice. For these creature tips, I am going to focus on spacefaring creatures with the Galactic Adventures expansion pack. Making animals is totally different, and making spacefaring species without the Galactic Adventures expansion pack are totally different things. The complexity meter is a wily minx. To combat her, I give my species one or two standout characteristics that make them pop. You want to pack in as much character as you can while keeping your complexity in the yellow. And while that can be tricky, just think of the races from Star Wars. Twi'lek, Keldor, Quarren, Celestian, Nautilin. All of them have two arms, two legs, a surprise mystery torso, and a very distinctive, unique head. More often than not, that's the way to go. But that doesn't mean you're limited to the same design with every creature. There are a lot of ways to slap together two legs, some arms, and a head. And to help guide that process, you need to have some foresight. Er, sporesight. <laughs> Am I right? Sorry. In the creature editor, be thinking about what you want the species to be. Are they proud and noble warriors? Then straighten their backs, make them tall and strong. Are they greasy little traders and tinkerers? Then shrink them down and give them a funny little pot belly. Most importantly, take time to give your creatures some actual posture. Don't just leave them with stiff knees and a T-pose. It also helps to not leave the spine as a noodle. Having a chest and waist will help things look more natural, and it'll really help with outfitting later on. To add more character, we start getting into detailed bits. You can hold control to snap sections of limbs apart and place them elsewhere. I do this almost every single time to give my creatures unique heads. You can also make more interesting heads using anything. Layer some ears, piece together some neural downs, stick some eyes inside of a nose, anything. One thing I love to do is to use the here bear ears as eyebrows. They move with the eyes to emphasize expressions. You can also give things a default expression this way. For my snoodle species, the base model has an expression that I wanted to say, oh, hello. But for their military leader, Captain Snoot, I gave him a much colder expression. Overall, you want to try and make things make sense to tell a story about your creature through their appearance alone. You can use the Spore archetypes to guide that. If you didn't know, as you play through the game, you end each stage in a certain color, red, blue, or green. When you reach the space stage, those colors that you ended in are totaled up and used to determine the philosophy of your species. This changes the background of your species and it decides which special ability you get. Zealots have Fanatical Frenzy, which instantly converts a system to your control, which breaks the galactic code, so watch out. Diplomats have Static Cling, which shuts down all ships and turrets on a planet. Shamans have Return Ticket, which lets you instantly warp back to your home system from anywhere in the galaxy. Not only are these abilities really useful, but knowing which one of these philosophy types you're shooting for can guide the creation of your species. My scientist species, for example, are the Helians. They're cold and unfeeling, dismantling their opponents with facts and logic. Because of that, I gave them big brain tubes and no eyes. It makes them look soulless and uncaring. That way they can drop on a planet and use Gravitation Wave, which is just the genocide button, and it makes sense. That's what I use to help me figure out what I'm going for with the species, and it always helps narrow down the design choices. And now, I'm going to speedrun some basic editor tips. You hold A as you place parts to make them asymmetrical. This makes them take up less complexity and can be used to make things way more interesting. Alt allows you to copy pieces. If you want a tail, use an arm, not the spine. It is better in every way. If you use a limb to make a head, put the mouth down first, then slide the limb over it. If you don't, it will be horrible. If you want a specific pose for hands and arms, don't give your species graspers. 
If they don't have graspers, they don't move their arms when they're doing their animations. That way they'll maintain their pose. There are four main ways that your creature can move. Walk normally with legs, clench up like a worm with no legs, glide around on the ground by shrinking a two joint leg and foot as close to the ground as possible, or by using invisible limbs. Making invisible limbs is kinda tricky, but you take a spine segment and set it on the ground. You then take a limb and put it on the tip of the spine. Scale the first joint up as big as it can go, then just touch one of the other joints to snap it up, like so. If you get it right, you can shrink the first joint back down and it'll disconnect from the body. When it does that, it vanishes. Then, you can either leave it as one leg to have a little hoppy animation, or add another limb to reveal the invisible one and split it into two, which will give you a side-to-side -side sway. That's how you make floating creatures. I like to slightly exaggerate the head, hands, and feet. Not too much, because proportions are still important, but Spore caters to a cartoony aesthetic, and I think this works really well. If you're making your creature in Creature Sage, and you're ready to move on to Tribal, here's my two cents if you also have Galactic Adventures. Unless a combat piece is integral to the look of your creature, remove it. What you're really going to benefit from down the line is level 5 health, sneak, sprint, jump, and the highest social skills that you can get. So if you run into an adventure where you're asked to make friends with someone, you can do it and you don't fail. When you're making your captain later on, you're going to want to focus on weapons, health, and energy. You really don't want to spend your unlock points on these social pieces. To get the buffs from pieces without ruining the look of your creature, shrink them all the way down and rotate them inside of the body using tab. You can tuck the nubs under the shoulders to hide them completely. That way you get all of the good stuff without having them show. Ideally, you want to finish up your creature with a distinctive posture, shape, and head while also trying to keep your complexity in the yellow. It's a tall order, I know, and you don't have to do this every time. Moving on to outfitting. There are so many things to learn, but the most important one is what I've always called parka fitting. Parka Boy was the first person to my knowledge who really popped off and perfected it. What it is, is basically this. You take the screw piece, stick another piece like the clock on it, then rotate those pieces around to position them inside of the body. That's how you get form-fitting armors and layered bits as well. Going back to the Helians, I slid these pieces into their shoulders, then layered these pieces on top of those. After that, I took the stovepipe pieces and put them on the connection points so it looks like moving, flexible armor. To save on complexity though, you don't always have to do that to get pieces to look like they're set in the middle of an arm. For my gims, I knew I wanted to give them a little bracer on one arm, and I knew I wanted to give them mechanical looking legs. Looking at them outfitted, you can assume that underneath those little robot legs or underneath that gauntlet, it's just another arm. But in the creature editor, I made their legs and that arm out of the thinnest exoskeleton pieces that I could get. That way, you can just slap pieces directly in the middle and it gives the illusion that there are real arms and legs underneath. Even though the creature is slightly cursed. You can take this to extreme lengths, like with some of the creatures by Photosynthesis. Must be a super cool alien in that mech suit, right? Nope. It is literally sticks and a mouth. He knew what he was going for and used the creature part of it just as a base. That's typically how you want to make any robotic creature. Doing these kinds of advanced outfitting techniques requires you to already know what the finished product is going to look like while you're in the creature editor. Mavor is one of the best creators making things today, and he'll make a creature that and build a whole scene for them out of outfit parts. It's insane, and it requires laying the groundwork out before he moves on to outfitting. The point being, once you mess around with outfitting a few times, it helps to try and anticipate how you're going to outfit your creature. Having a rough idea can let you make smart choices that'll help you later on. Like when I made these guys, I knew I wanted them to be leaning back, holding a big ass gun, so I gave them no hands so their arms would stay in position, and stuck this little stick limb on their left arm. That allowed me to build a gun using that limb as a base and then I built a glove holding onto the weapon for the other hand. It could be more basic though. Maybe you want to give them one really cool shoulder pauldron, right? So then you can use asymmetry to detail the shoulder that won't be covered. That allows you to have more detail overall while not killing your complexity. Those are the main techniques for outfitting. It honestly just requires a lot of experimentation and fiddling with, but the possibilities are endless. Real quick before we move on, I wanted to clarify something. I said before that making animals and spacefaring species without galactic adventures was different. The differences are, with animals, you don't need to focus on packing character into their faces. 
you don't even need to focus on their heads at all. They can look more, as dumb as it sounds, animalistic. This is where I'll make things with multiple legs, cool shells, etc, etc. You can go buck wild. If you're not going to outfit them and make them into a spacefaring species, you can max out the complexity and get really funky with your shapes. If you are making a spacefaring species that won't turn into a captain because you don't have galactic adventures, then you don't need to worry about their abilities at all. You can also use up a little bit more of your complexity. Once you're out of the creature stage, you'll never need to play them again, so you don't need to worry about social skills, their health, or their movement. Alright, buildings! Two very important things to know here. To rotate a base piece like this, you can't use tab. You have to put it on a connector, then use tab on the connector. Pain in the ass, but that's the way it is. You can hold control to move pieces vertically. Hold shift to move them around without changing their heights. You can hold shift and control while you're holding alt to copy pieces to make either a bunch of them at the same height or in the same position. One of the most common things to do is to hold control as you copy to make a multi-storied look like this. The most important technique in the building editor is to let the paint do the work for you. Something like this is pretty simple when it comes right down to it. I wanted something kind of Star Wars-y, and so I put this together pretty quickly, but good lord, I spent damn near an hour getting the paint right. I like to use striped metallic paints for glass and windows because I think it looks the most like glass, and in something like this, it gives the illusion that the building is like a hundred stories tall because of all the different levels, you know? You can also take advantage of the fact that Spore has kind of shite geometry for a lot of the building pieces. For this pumping station, I wanted to jazz up these chambers without spending a lot of parts. Using one semi-detailed paint and then two domes, they went from this to this. Super simple, but pretty effective. As far as design goes, it can be super overwhelming making a building set for your species. But again, try and think of who they are using those space stage archetypes. For my zealot species, their city hall is a cathedral with a giant sculpture of their heads on it. It shows their obsession with their own beliefs and how their leaders are always looking down on the common folk, making sure that everyone conforms. And since I use these arching pieces so much in the city hall, I also use them as the main forms in everything else. Having cohesion in a theme like this makes your cities look really, really good. It can also help to take elements of your creatures and use them to make Make your set more unique. Can they fly? You can put the doors on high platforms and decorate the ground then. Are they insects? Maybe you can make like an augmented hive. You basically want to take all the information you have about your creatures and use that to help you figure out where you want to go. I used a similar idea in my most recent set for my diplomat species. Even though every city needs a factory, I didn't want mine to be full of a bunch of gears and wheels and smoke. They're diplomats, so I made their factory into a communications array so that they can mediate conflicts and earn their money that way. Some other tips. Control your colors. Try to have something more cohesive and easy on the eyes instead of loud and complicated. There's a time and a place for everything, and everything should be done in moderation. Try and keep your windows and your doors on the smaller side. It lets your buildings look way bigger, which makes them make more sense when you look at them in the space stage. A lot of the time, you won't want shapes to be so damn thick, so pull them out to the extremities and then shrink them down. That way you can have much thinner, cleaner shapes. Now, I'm not an architect and there are billions of possibilities for these buildings, so if you want solid reference points, I think Parker Boy is really good at building cohesive sets, and Mushroom King 1 and Endeavor are the best with buildings that I know of. There are tons of others, but those three should give you plenty of reference. You can learn a lot just by dismantling some of their insane creations. Vehicles! Good God. This one is definitely a doozy. You can really do anything with vehicles, but my biggest tip is to make it greater than the sum of its parts. What I mean is with something like this, the complexity is maxed out, but it looks pretty simple, right? But as I take it apart, you can see that everything layers and melts together to form one solid whole. That's how you get nice unique shapes for your vehicles. Also real quick, since we're already looking at it, you can see that again, striped metallic paints still look like glass and I like to use them for the bridge and other viewports. I also like to use lights for the engines instead of the actual engine pieces because they look cooler and they take up less complexity. There's also a lot that you can do to give your vehicles a sense of scale. 
This is a small single pilot starfighter. It has fighter jet proportions with a large cockpit, but this one I modeled after a Mon Cal cruiser. It's supposed to be massive. This is the ship that I used for the Helians, that scientist species, and this is the big genocide button laser. But in the back, you can see varied engine shapes, which makes it look larger, and most importantly, there are these spots. The bridge, these are supposed to be hangar bays, and then the two lower decks where the laser controls are. And with this one again, you can see the melting and layering of parts to make one big ship. One of the coolest ships that uses this kind of forced perspective is the Dautilus, I think I said that right, the Dautilus Cruiser by Pizalis. You can see how he's fit all of these shapes together to form one massive hull, but he also included these little strips that have a scattered black and blue paint, which makes it look like thousands of tiny lights. Super, super cool. You can use paints to great effect with vehicles. This tank by H.R. Matthew is a great example. Circular textures here for the hatches, this meshy texture on the sides that looks like rocket pods, the vented gun barrels, and different metal textures to show armor plating. All of it together makes it look amazing. Just like the Sakuma Redshift 2000 from RG4327. He published it just a few days ago, but oh my god, it looks so clean. You can see how he used pieces to poke through to give it a clean little racing stripe, and then look at the back end here. Goddamn. Beautiful. All thanks to good paints and a smart use of parts. For a technical tip, you can hold shift to move your entire vehicle, which is really handy if you realize you started building it too close to the edge or if it's too high up. For one of the trickier techniques, I made a No Man's Sky knockoff. See how these engines look like they're nestled into the side of the hull? Well, they're not connected to any of it. What you do for things like this is you take the two-piece and shrink it down to a stick, then lay it sideways. Then you build your engines on either end of it. Then you fiddle with it to get it set in the middle of the ship. Using that technique of sticking bits on the end of a pole can create some amazing designs. My creations are usually more rounded and smooth, but people use the same method to make chunkier, more geometric frigates and ships like things from Halo. If you want to save on complexity, you can do something like what Minkrill does. He takes a single hole piece, usually this one, and flips it upside down to make a nice gun deck. Then he builds the rest of the ship by meticulously placing these detail pieces together. Insanely cool, but personally, I would lose my mind doing this. I'm editing this together right now, and I just realized that Mean Krill also does this asymmetrically. Crazy person. My last bits for vehicles are don't worry about what category a piece is in. Use cockpits as hull sections, use weapons as pipes, use wings as rings, it doesn't matter. The vehicle editor offers damn near limitless freedom. If you're struggling with ideation for vehicles, I always think it's good to look for reference. Again, you can look up designs from Halo, Stellaris, Star Wars, No Man's Sky, whatever you want. There's a whole galaxy of possibilities with these vehicles. And now for the big one. Spode on a toad, there is a lot and I mean a lot of shit to learn with the Adventure Editor. First and foremost, for your own good, download the 100 point Maxis Adventures forecast. I'll try to link it below. All of these adventures are super easy and they're all worth 100 points. Play them all really quickly to power level your captain. Alright, first up with the editor, I'm gonna go over the do's and don'ts of the actual game mechanics. One of the most important things to know is that the ground is your best friend. As much as you can, do not put creatures objects, or anything else on floating buildings. The chance of things glitching through the floor and rendering an objective impossible is like really, really high. If you absolutely need to put them in floating buildings, slide an invisible jump pad under their feet and they won't clip through as easily. Even on the ground, the AI has trouble with follow commands. If you want something to follow your player, make sure that the path that they'll be following along is wide open and clear of obstacles. If it isn't, they'll get stuck like a clean 80% of the time. The most important thing to do with the AI is to test it over and over and over again. Make sure everything works before you go through all of the effort and publish the adventure. You don't want to have people play it and have it end up being impossible. I've done that. Five times. Most of the time it won't be an issue until you start getting into advanced behaviors. You pop open the behavior tab of a creature, hold control while selecting a behavior, and this new window pops up. This is where you can do some really cool stuff. Say you want to add some optional trading without having it as an objective. Like you lock a heel behind a gate and have the guy next to it say, hey, drop me a coin and I'll drop you the key. To do this, you need at least two acts. In the first one, you put the key right in front of their face and tell them to pick it up always. Then, in whatever act you want them available to trade with, you do this. You set them to drop the key if they're aware of the coin, 
and pick up the coin always. That way, when you bring him a coin, he'll drop the key, then you drop the coin, he picks up the coin, and you get the key. You can set them to just give your players the key, and then you can walk up and rip it out of their hands, but for trading, the give and receive options have never consistently worked for me. You can also use advanced behaviors in other really cool ways. Maybe you want things to stay still, but if a big creature gets too close, they run away scared, or even run to a specific spot. Or you can do something like this. I didn't want to make this boss fight just battling a creature, so I set these little mouths to pick up bombs and walk through teleporters. Then I had them and the bombs respawn using the respawn timer down here. So now the boss fight is maneuvering around the room to knock the boss off of the ceiling while the defense system, which I made out of those teleporters, the bombs, the jump pads, the whole thing, the defense system throws bombs at you. It makes for a more interesting fight rather than just the typical blasting creatures. You can also use tiny respawning creatures for some other cool effects. Say you want ships constantly attacking a building, but you want them attacking different spots. So put a teleporter down and have little tiny creatures set to walk in into it. Put them on a respawn timer and poof! Now the ship is lasering it and the laser moves and it has a nice little explosion at the end and it just looks really cool. A crucial component to making adventures is also unlocking the behavior tab. This is what lets you make their behavior different between each act. You can have them appear and disappear or you can have them set to meet someone and talk to them while they're stationary. Then they say something like, follow me, and when the act switches over, you set them to move and make their path. With these movement commands, you use Alt to copy things, just like all the other editors, and you use it to add more waypoints. The more waypoints you have, the less likely it is that they'll stray from the path and get stuck. Now when things do attack, it's important to remember that not everyone is going to be playing with a maxed out captain. They might have low damage, no health regen, and weak energy. It's always better to make sure that things are balanced for the weaker end. That way newer captains can get through it and max level captains will feel understandably strong. Speaking of difficulty, if you're going to hide objectives, give your players some clues in the act description. That way, if they miss dialogue, they don't have to play the entire adventure over again to hear it. If you're gonna leave mercenaries around for captains to ally with to help them take down targets, you also need to balance their social skills for the low end. I said earlier that you should max your social skills on creatures for adventures, but a lot of people don't. If you have a mercenary there to help someone through a fight, but they have level 5 dance and sing, people probably won't be able to use them. Give them weaker skills to make sure that players have a better chance of allying with them. Also, don't get locked in your own head. If an objective makes sense to you, that's fine, but other people may not understand what they need to do. There was one I played not too long ago, where you get locked in a chamber with a ticking bomb. You have to ally with this servant outside of the gate, and then he'll unlock it, but it isn't clear, and I had to retry the whole adventure twice before I noticed them. Most people will not retry it. They'll fail it once and leave. Now, with buildings, you'll want to use gates as much as you can. You get a gate, click Disguise, and choose the building that you want. This way they take up less complexity and their hitboxes aren't so ridiculously stupid. That's how you can get a city set up where vehicles can be moving around and it also helps with creature pathfinding. Just make sure that if your city is made of disguised blue gates that you don't use blue keys at all in the adventure. You can also make props in the vehicle editor and disguise that as a gate as well. That way you can have working lights and such that look like building components. It's also way easier to build screens and displays in the vehicle editor. To disguise a gate as a creature you do this. Go to disguises, click on something, but click edit, not the check mark. In the editor, hit your Sporpedia, go to creatures, and ta-da! You have a statue. You can use this to put things in stasis, make posed dead bodies, or make custom plants using creature parts. I think that's really cool. If you have stairs or a bridge that your feet clip into, take a jump pad and turn it invisible. Then make the path out of those and it'll function like a solid path. You can of course use this to also make invisible bridges if you want. Speaking of which, you can also make giant invisible gates to prevent players from wandering outside of the mission area. You can also disguise gates as something like a mass of vines. Then disguise the corresponding key as something like a machete. Or you can disguise a gate as a wooden castle door and disguise the key as a rustic metal one. Doing that can really help keep things themed. Disguising power-ups as other things can make things feel fresh too. Instead of a health hologram, make it into a first aid kit, a healing potion, or things like that. With buildings, you also want to try to pack as much as you can into a single structure. Like for this new studio, I didn't want to make the screen, the desk, the camera, all as separate things. 
I had to split it up to get the scale right, but this room is just three disguised gates. The dressing room next door is just one. You can also do something like this. Once I got the corner building in place, I experimented and got the shid energy drink stand set up too. It's all one building, but it looks like more. You can either do interiors where you walk into an open building or where you teleport through a door. I think teleporting is a little better because you can change the lighting, the atmosphere, music, etc. if you place your interior build farther away. Building interiors takes trial and error to get the scale right. I like to lay out rough shapes first, and after I'm happy with the layout and the scale, then I start to decorate and paint to save myself a lot of trouble. If you want to have air or space vehicles flying through a city, set them on a patrol and use alt to make new waypoints. You can bring it back and link it with the starting position to make a closed circuit. Sometimes you have to shrink the vehicle down to see that starting point. Aircraft love to fly way the hell up in the sky between points, so if you use more waypoints and keep the distance short between them, they'll fly low. I really like to use a lot of trees if I'm not making a desolate planet. It breaks things up, adds a ton of color, and prevents huge blocks of blank, boring sky. If you want an adventure to feel like you travel to different planets, you can use different elevations to change the ground color. If you want to make players swim underneath something, make an invisible curve out of gates. It'll force players underwater and then up through the other side. Grouping things to a team will let them attack anything they see except for their allies. Very useful for battles. To wrap up, I want to look at the best adventure in terms of like proficiency in the editor that I have ever seen. Until the Last One Falls by Derezd. Right off the bat though, I want to point this out. Remember how I said to avoid placing creatures on floating buildings? This is why. When I loaded it this time, the captain is bugged and starts on the ground, making it impossible to do anything. Put him back in the room though, and now we can see some really high level adventure techniques. First off, look at this, right by where we first start out. This looks super weird, just floating out here, right? But watch this. One of the objectives is to examine the clock on the wall, and when we do so, it zooms us out just like normal. But He's positioned this diorama in the perfect place outside to create a comic book cutscene. Insane! So, we walk out of the main character's apartment, and now we're in a spaceship. Derez is using moments like this to show jumps in time, to split the setting and have it feel like we're really walking through their life. It is so damn cool. The medical ship that you're on is being attacked, and when you get in the escape pod, watch this. Examine the escape pod controls and... See that? A whole ass cutscene where we see the orbiting space station, the zoom into the planet that we're crash landing on, and then the animated freeze frames showing our journey in the escape pod. This takes so much time, so much trial and error, so much meticulous tweaking. He had to know exactly where the camera froze while examining the controls and then built this whole scene in exactly the right spot. The way that he can use illusions and force perspective like this is masterful. He also uses spots like this where he has a mini city on the horizon. You take a couple steps towards it and it teleports you into the actual city. It makes it feel like you're covering great distances and flashing forward in time. If you want to learn anything about making better adventures, just look at this one. Spend half an hour tinkering with it in the editor. It is amazing. And just like the other editors, a lot of creating adventures comes down to battling your complexity, making the most of what you have, and using illusions and perspective to make things feel way cooler than they really are. In every single editor, you really want to be asking yourself, how can I do more with what I have? How can I make this new and different? Woo! And I do believe that that's all that I wanted to talk about. I hope some of it helped out, at least a little bit. To be honest, it was kind of a tough video to make. I could talk about making things in Spore for hours. If you want extra help with any of the editors, just hit me up in the comments and I'll try to do what I can. But yeah, this was a really fun video to make, and I'm really happy with how it all came together. If you enjoyed it, I would really appreciate your subscription, as always. Because even though it was fun to make, it was a ton of work. Most of the creatures and creations that I showed that were mine, I made specifically for this video. I hope that made it better having kind of accurate visual aids on on screen at the same time, but most importantly I'm super excited to see what any of you put out on the Sporpedia in the weeks to come. Again, thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Bye!